Hey, welcome to the New Story Podcast. I'm your host, Isaac, aka Shrek. Today, we are off to East Africa, Tanzania, to chat with Eric Allard. Now, some of you wonder who the hell is Eric Allard. He's the director of Extreme Blue Water Spearfishing. It's based in um, Tanzania. He's a really interesting character. He grew up in Mombasa, uh, Kenya, and started fishing at, at the age of six. So he's he's been fishing a little while because... Uh, He's been guiding alone in Tanzania for more than 10 years and chasing some of the biggest dog tooth tuna in the world at um, famous spots like Latham Island. Um, he features heavily on Barrett Harvey's African Spearfishing Diaries vid, so you might have seen him around. He's also been uh, probably one of the most requested uh, people to get on the podcast, so it was a real pleasure to get him. We did have some spotty internet connections, so I'm wondering what magic my uh, audio editor, Pat Dwyer, can um, do for us today, but let's see how it goes. Hey, before we hook into this episode, I just wanted to let you know, now, noobspirit.com, it's more than just a spearfishing podcast. It's more than just the home. Um, on the website now, it's been newly redesigned. You can find all the show notes to every episode ever recorded. And inside a show notes page, like for example, there'll be pictures of the guests, there'll be sponsor deals, there'll be links to the videos and items we discuss on the podcast. So that's always good to check out. Also on the website, there's uh, a new ultimate guide series. So basically like if you want to learn about one specific topic of spearfishing, for example, like blue water hunting, then there's a blue water ultimate spearfishing guide series and it'll have all of the best episodes we've done relevant blog posts videos everything so if you go to newspirit.com check that out ultimate guides there's also a new section for every listener um if you go to noobspirit.com, head up to the menu, there's a section called Nooba Stories, and um, you can leave me a comment or an audio clip that I could maybe include in the podcast, and it's your opportunity to ask questions, share a story, scare a, share something um, scary that's happened to you or whatever you've learned along the way, and uh, it'd be cool to hear from you guys, so noobspirit.com. Also, if you want some merch, if you want to support the show, buy a shirt or a hat or a hoodie, a sticker or even a set of custom-designed de um, penetrator fins. That's also available there, newspirit.com. There's also a link to the community on Facebook and the Floater email newsletter, which is about a monthly email newsletter that comes out with the latest and what's happening around the New Spiro studio. But anyway, as usual, New Spiro podcast, the home of everything spearfishing, and uh, today an interview with an absolute legend. We're headed to Zanzibar in Tanzania. Eric Allard, Extreme Blue Water Spearfishing. Let's go. Way back in 2001, Adreno, or as it was then known, Adrenaline, was a tiny shop in the back streets of Woolloongabba. And at the time, it was nearly impossible to find decent spearfishing equipment, especially at an affordable rate. Since then, hundreds, thousands of people have discovered the joys of spearfishing through Adreno's store. They've gone on and built four stores all across Australia. We've got Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, and Perth and their online shop at spearfishing.com offers a completely different experience than what we're used to finding online in the spearfishing world. If you want free information, you can check out their blog at spearfishing.com or their YouTube channel, shop at spearfishing.com.au. Use the code NoobSpearer, you can save $20 on every purchase over 200. And I know lots of noobers have made use of this code over the years. A big thanks to today's sponsor, Adreno. All right. Um, so uh, you've been requested on the show quite a lot, Eric. So it's bloody good to get you with me. And uh, welcome to the No Sparrow podcast. We're, we're on board. We're live. Uh, hi there, Isaac. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm sorry it took so long. Nah, no worries. You're a busy man running all these expeditions up and down the east coast of Africa there. Tell us a little bit about um, your business and, and what it is you get up to most days of the week. I'm, uh, I'm running a spearfishing charter that I set up in uh, Tanzania uh, approximately 10 years ago. Uh, so I live at the moment I live in the Zanzibar archipelago and uh, run our spearfishing charters out of Zanzibar pretty much throughout Tanzania. Um, yeah, that's it. Fantastic. So I was chatting with you a little bit before. Um, you feature heavily heavily in, uh, in Barrett Harvey's uh, African Spearfishing Diaries uh, YouTube videos, which he's launching every other week at the moment or every week. And, um, and a lot of the stuff's filmed with you and, uh, and Nigel. 
Yeah, so Nigel's my, uh, my business partner in the spearfishing charter. And we don't just do spearfishing, we also have a freediving school. We teach uh, spearfishing courses and we do a, a bit of other stuff, ocean related. Uh, so that's Nigel. Um, he's a childhood friend and we formed the company together about 10 years ago. And in 2011, uh, through Rob Allen, because we were buying Rob Allen equipment, while I was in South Africa at the, fish, uh, at the dive factory, uh, he said, well, why don't you meet this guy? And, uh, and there was Barrett with his big smile, and we got talking. <laughs> and uh, I was just picking up a whole bunch of equipment and a boat, and I was just about to leave to drive back all the way to Tanzania with, uh, with the boat and all this equipment and Nigel. And, uh, and Barrett was there. We got chatting, and we said, well, why don't we meet in Tanzania? and do some diving together. And he said, sure, and I'll do some filming. And that's how it all started. A few months later, he was with us. And um, you also know um, Chris Coates and uh, David Ocho is over there now. I think he's with you some of the time. Is that right? You know, after the first uh, South Africans started coming spearfishing in Tanzania and the word started spreading in South Africa, then Chris Coates immediately got interested, contacted me and, and we started a bit of a friendship. We don't do much together. Uh, we have worked together in the mm. past. Um, we remain in contact. We're mutually good friends. And David yeah. Oshoa, David Oshoa was a bit of a surprise, actually. We advertised for a spearfishing guiding job in Madagascar for our Madagascar operation a couple of years ago. And, mm. David, and David applied. And I was super, super um, amazed that he did and we got went through the interview process with several other people and of course he came on top of it and he spent uh, one and a half years guiding for us yeah wow wow he's a super cool dude and he's um he's gotten around and uh, so it's pretty cool and um your part of the world's been quite well photo uh, photographed in the in recent years um some amazing fish come out of there can you give us a bit of a a sort of a, an overview of, of um, what people sort of can get get hold of in your part of the world. Yes, we um, you know we, we we started this charter just just as an idea or a suggestion from a friend from South Africa. Um, we never thought we would do it, but eventually we just Nigel and I just said let's give it a go, and here we are ten years later uh, running these charters, which have now become pretty well known, as you say. And a lot of that thanks to Barrett and David, because without two guys who film uh, with the quality that they do, you know, we wouldn't be here. So lots of thanks to those two guys. And we still take them around the world whenever we do trips uh, that we can take them with us. Um, so, you know, basically what we did is we, we created a charter that would target mainly pelagic fish. We didn't want to target resident species such as groupers and parrotfish and some other resident reef fish that are super important to the dive industry, scuba diving industry. So we're mainly targeting pelagic fish. And of course, we were lucky enough to have Latham Island near us with a huge giant dogtooth aggregation. And everybody is so keen to hunt dogtooth. And we we landed some of the biggest in the world, and that drew a lot of attention to our area. And uh, basically, every year, year since we've started, we've been landing these massive dog tooth. And yeah, I guess that's our our calling card for East Africa. Cool, cool. All right, how, how did um, how did spearfishing start for you? Like, um, where were you living, and and um, how old were you when you started? So I was born in Kenya. Um, I now live in Tanzania, but I was born in Kenya, and my youth. Uh, I was in Kenya, uh, growing up along the coast. And as a young boy, probably nine, 10 years old, I picked up my first spear gun. And now I'm coming on 53, so approximately 43 years ago, I started spearfishing. Can you remember any of the early um, lessons and things that you um, learned spearfishing? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, you know, especially at a young age, everything is is experimental you just don't know and uh, yeah that you need to have basically the right gun for the uh, the fish that you're hunting you need to have the right equipment um, 
you need to protect yourself from the sun and uh, stingy things. That's a lesson I learned when I was very young. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a, that sounds like a painful lesson. <laughs> it was a painful lesson, absolutely, but it didn't stop me going back the next day and the next day. So, I mean, what what was it that appealed to you about spearfishing? Um, what 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 set you alight? It's uh, it's the hunt. I don't know. It's an instinct that's fulfilled. It's uh, it's the time you spend out on the ocean. Uh, it's 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 a combination of things. And at the end of the day, bringing home a catch, uh, which allows the whole experience to continue, even though you're out of the ocean. Mm, mm, mm. So have you got a passion for cooking um, seafood as well as catching it? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, the main reason for the spearfishing is at the end of the day, sharing your catch with your family or friends or even if you're on your own with a bottle of wine. Absolutely, I do have a passion for cooking my catch. What about two bottles of wine? Yeah, on certain occasions, yes. I don't want it to affect my dive the next day. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem, isn't it? It is. Especially as you start to get older. Like, um, I'm only 38, but I already feel it. So what do you do? Um, who, who did you go out with in those early dives? Nine or ten years old, I'm taking maybe you had an older brother or did someone take you out and show you the ropes? No, actually I was alone. That was, uh, that was quite interesting. I look back at that and wonder what my parents were thinking because – I did not have a mentor at that time. I didn't have anyone that would accompany me. I would just walk onto the beach with my gear and then just wade out in the shallows as the tide uh, dropped and, uh, and just uh, go into the small tidal pools and start looking for whatever I could find, whether it was octopus or small fish. And there was no one with me. So, you know, I basically started just with a hand spear and then I met local fishermen who had these homemade guns, and then I learned to make one of those. And it just progressively, you know, continued from there. I didn't go out with anybody to start with. What about the freediving side of things? Did you did you have any troubles with that? I mean, nine or ten years old, um, I, I mean, I guess you, you start pretty shallow and then you just slowly progress, but can you, can, can you remember having any troubles with freediving in particular? No, no, I never did. I think that's the difference of starting when you're really, really young because you don't even think about it. You know, you just hold your breath and dive to the shallow depth that you can. And progressively, you try to dive a bit deeper, but you never have this pressure of, of, of trying to learn quickly to target a specific fish. Uh, so, you know, it, you never really think about it. It just comes naturally. Never had any issues with that. I've got you down for a 104 kilogram dog tooth tuna. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Really? I've got some of you. Is that is that one of the fish you've taken? <laughs> yeah, yes, I did. That's my biggest dog tooth. It's um just what two kilo shy of the world record. Yeah, a little bit more. Uh, I think the current record's at 109 kilos. And, yeah, the biggest we've actually landed at Latham was slightly bigger, was 110.3. Wow. Yeah, so I'm about so six kilos was it, off. Was that never declared a world record? No, despite uh, several attempts to do so with the IUSA, uh, it was never ratified as a world record. Oh, bugger, bugger. So with your uh, smaller 104-kilogram dog tooth, uh, pretty much a puppy, really. Um, was that an exciting hunt? <laughs> yes, that was a superb hunt, actually. It was, uh, I would say it was my favorite hunt okay. um, in the sense that you know, I, I tend to like to hunt dog tooth a specific way, uh, which is to drop down on them rather than lying on the bottom uh, or encountering the um, broadside uh, in midwater, I would rather be dropping down on them because I feel the fish is calmer. Uh, it can see you dropping down, but it doesn't quite understand that you're a threat. Uh, the way it does if you're lying on the bottom or, you know, you're basically facing them broadside. So, and it was an interesting situation because, you know, I was on a charter. I had two of my old time clients with me. They were hunting dog tooth. Uh, they're mad about dog tooth, actually, and uh, <laughs> they had never shot any good ones. 
So one of the guys wasn't feeling well, so he stayed on the yacht, and I took the other guy out. And in between drifts at one point, he said, listen, why don't you just take my friend's gun? And I was like, no, 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 it's okay. I'm shooting bait fish. You know, I'll make sure you, that we bring some fish up for you. And, you know, he insisted and insisted, no, 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 take the gun, shoot a fish, shoot a fish. So I picked up his friend's gun. And uh, a couple of drifts later, I found myself dropping down on a large school of dogtooth below me. And I singled out big fish, considerably bigger than the rest of the school. And I just uh, glided down gently, gently with my gun tucked in close to me so it couldn't really detect my gun. And the current was strong. I was slowly getting pushed away from the fish who was just swimming into the current, uh, not going anywhere, but just staying stationary. And as, as I noticed, I was getting a little bit out of range. I just finned in closer and took the shot. And it hit that sweet spot just behind the head and stoned the fish. <laughs> The, the, uh, yeah, the fish didn't go through. I mean, the spear didn't go completely through. And I noticed, and then the fish suddenly, as dog tooth do, you need some luck. I mean, it doesn't matter how good the shot is. With dog tooth, you need to have some luck. So it's an integral part of, of spear fishing. And this fish suddenly came alive again, and it started swimming up, fortunately, up towards the surface. And I noticed the spear wasn't out. I mean, it wasn't completely through on the other side. So I sort of put some tension on the line just to not let the spear shake too much. And the fish was swimming up, and I eventually managed to grab it in my hands and swim up to it with the surface. And then I realized, holy cow, this is a big fish. Shit. And wow, there you go. It was 104 kilos. I can't tell you the face of my uh, client who was in the water with me. <laughs> <laughs> they never told me to pick up again, again, a gun again. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that. He probably regretted his generosity. <laughs> yeah, but, but the great thing Jeez. was that at the end of the story is that the other client got so inspired, he lost, you know, he suddenly felt much better. He came out with us in the afternoon and he landed his personal best dog to the 72 kilos. So, you know, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. one fish somehow inspired him and, and he landed his, which was at the time was a Middle East record for dog tooth. Yeah, wicked. Yeah. Wicked. He would have been stoked. Um, with dog tooth, like, I, I talk about it every other episode, I swear. To, I swear, like, every, they. The people seem to get the bug. I've never shot one, right? So what I'm what I'm sort of hearing though is is that maybe there's this there's this progression. Like you you don't go from not shooting a dog tooth to shooting a hundred and four kilo one. Um, there there seems to need to be these steps in between. Um, what have you noticed with all of the clients you've taken out hunting them over the years? Yes, I mean you know practically every client that comes here is uh, is looking to shoot a dog tooth. Uh, especially the experienced guys. Uh, the not-so-experienced Mediterranean fishermen, spear fishermen, are keen to also land a wahoo and start a little bit uh, with a lower target than a dog tooth. But, yeah, I mean, it, it, like you say, it's, uh, it is a bit of a progression and you don't immediately land a big fish. And people are super stoked with any dog tooth that they land because they're so challenging to, to spear uh, and then actually to land is a whole other thing. So when you actually get one in your hands, you're like, wow, you know, it doesn't matter what the size is. I mean, this is my first dog tooth. This is a special fish. Mm, mm, mm. Cool. Um, David Dupav, uh, recently uh, become acquainted with him. He's another man you've had some exposure to. Yes, yes. I've been so unlucky to have David in my life for four years. <laughs> no, David's four a great years, guy. Yeah. He worked as a guide for us, and he's yeah. been one of our best guides ever. I had a really, really good, fun relationship with him. We worked great. We did a lot of charters together, and uh, he also worked in Madagascar for us. He's a great, great okay. uh, Spiro, great guy, very good guide. Mm -hmm. So when you take guys out hunting dogtooth tuna, um, obviously you you guys have a recommended equipment set up or, or do you allow the clients to um, just pick and choose as they see fit? Or is that a delicate negotiation? No, 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 no. We, 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 definitely, we definitely lay it out there what they need to have. I mean, the last thing we want is guys shooting dogtooth with the right, wrong equipment you know, hurting the fish, uh, not only hurting the fish, possibly killing them, but not landing them. 
but also affecting the hunt for everybody else who's better equipped. Because the moment you start losing fish, you're driving the dog tooth deeper and further away from everyone else. So, uh, you know, lessening the chances of getting any. So, yeah, we certainly have a list of equipment that they should be bringing with them. And anything they don't have, we supply. Our charter includes the equipment. So, you know, whatever they don't have, we, we help them make the right setup. Hmm. Okay, cool. So, okay, so you've got a, a client that's coming out with you next week. Um, what's the process look like to prepare them for a hunt on their first dog tooth tuna? Well, you know, the first question would be, you know, what, what, what kind of depths are they uh, comfortable hunting at? Uh, that's an important one because generally dog tooth are pretty deep. And, uh, you know, our main dog tooth spot is Latham Island. This is where we see a very big aggregation of fish uh, from, let's say, September to March every year. Uh, so that's where we would be taking them. The spot we dive is, is a deep ledge, and the fish tend to come up off the ledge and sit midwater. But, you know, that still means being able to dive a minimum of 20 meters. So you may get lucky and bring the fish up higher, but... Uh, you know, shallower, but that's not uh, not what you should be counting on. So that's the first question is depth, you know, and then we'll ask, well, what kind of a gun are you using? What kind of a shaft are you using? And what's the rest of the setup? Make sure it's a breakaway, of course, no real guns. We don't, uh, we don't allow anyone to hunt the dog tooth with real guns. Um, and then, you know, we'll provide float lines and plenty of floats and everything else that they might need to, you know, to, to make their kit, uh, ready for for a hunt okay what's the success rate so you, like guys will shoot them but how many of those fish make it to the boat that's a very good question you know i think it depends on the location i mean we we've been running charters uh, in tanzania let's say out of zanzibar to latham island we've been running mm -hmm. madagascar and uh northern mozambique to another amazing spot that's called saint lazarus bank the structure of each location is very different, and it really it, it is really um, important towards the success rate. So the more, let's say, the flatter the bottom with less structure, the more likely you are to land the fish, because these fish, unless you get them a, a kill shot, they will go straight to the bottom and try and, and get that spear out of their bodies. They're gonna go and wrap themselves in coral, so the, the flatter the surface of the bottom, you know, the more likely you are to land it. So our, our success rate at Latham is very high. Could be as high as 70 to 80% of the fish that we shoot are landed. While in places mm. like St. Lazarus, where it's a lot more structure on the bottom, you know, it might be only two out of 10. Very interesting. We've gone straight into the deep stuff here with uh, with dog tooth, but it's uh, it's bloody it's a bloody interesting chat to have. They... they um, they fire up every single spear I've ever met, and I'd love to have an opportunity to take my first one. Um, I noticed also, Eric, that you've got a degree in marine science. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I, I did my university in the U.S. in Florida, um, and I earned a degree. I had a bachelor in uh, aquaculture technology, and I also have an associate degree in uh, oceanographic uh, technology. And. Um, and w while you were in Florida, which university did you study at and, and, and were you spearfishing while you lived there? Uh, I studied at uh, the Florida Institute of Technology, which was located in Melbourne, Florida. Uh, I think Canberra and Kirk Connell lives nearby there now. And okay. yes, I did spearfish. I spearfished off, uh, off that area as well as especially the Keys. The Florida Keys were great for spearfishing. Mm -hmm. Cool. So you, did you did you find um, what was the sort of the what's the difference between um, hunting in East Africa and hunting in Florida? Was it similar spearfishing? Yeah, I mean the species were different species. Uh, I, you know, I was still pretty young. I was uh, I, I I went to Florida when I was eighteen, and I left when I was twenty two at the uh, end of okay. my university. So, you know, I was still very much a reef spear fisherman targeting reef fish such as snappers. I was hunting groupers at the time. And uh, yeah, those were different species, but the spear fishing in itself was very similar. The hunt itself, slight differences in behaviors, but 
Yeah, coming hmm. coming from many many years of experience hunting in East Africa because I started so young. When I went to Florida, I mean, it was pretty pretty smooth transition. Hmm. Uh, how old were you when you started seriously targeting um, blue water species? Uh, I was actually pretty old. I started late. You see, in East Africa, we well in Kenya at the time, there was no real outside exposure to spearfishing. I mean. You know, there was no internet at the time, so we would get the occasional magazine, which would come from the Mediterranean. So there were small fish, generally, or groupers. So we were brief spear fishermen pretty much until about the year 1999, when we had this this uh, El Nino phenomenon um, that 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 brought this incredible happening here in East Africa at a certain time of the year. The, the sea was covered in these mantis shrimp, mantis prawns. Hmm. And so, okay. you know, you'd be on a boat and you could basically scoop these things up with a net and fill the boat with them. So along with all of these uh, mantis prawns swimming on the surface, the pelagics were there, the, the yellowfin tuna were going crazy and the wahoo and everything. And, you know, I, 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 by chance, I was in a fishing competition, not spear fishing, just fishing. So I was away from the reef, and I saw all these tuna just basically next to the boat. And I said, wait a minute, i got to come here with this spear gun. <laughs> and, uh, and, <laughs> and I sure did, and I landed my first yellowfin tuna uh, on a reel. And then that's, that's how it started. And then I met a few South African guys who were much more experienced in blue water spear fishing, and they showed me the ropes, uh, you know, with the flashers and float systems and so I was about 32 years old when I progressed from the reef to blue water. Okay, cool. And so yellowfin was an early target species. What was some of the – so you got lucky enough to land one on a reel. That sounds, that sounds like a pretty uh, adventurous um, decision to pull the trigger with a reel gun. <laughs> it was, actually. It was. It was quite a fight. It, it wasn't very big. It was only 36 kilos. But, hey, it was still, uh, it was still something. Big enough to drown you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, quickly, quickly after that, I put a an extra line on me with a with a small float, and and I landed many more in the following days. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. And then, um, so after yellowfin, um, I mean, when you started shooting some of these bigger fish, um, what were some of the things that became apparent uh, about the differences between reef and blue water? Um, obviously, the clean water is a huge one that a lot of people seem to struggle with. Is shot placement, does shot placement become more important? Um, yeah, shot placement is not necessarily very important. I mean, it is important to, to be able to put a holding shot on the fish. Uh, but, you know, especially for species like yellowfin, um, the, the actual spot you hit the fish uh, to get your spear through is not that important because these fish won't hit, they won't dive down to the reef and entangle themselves on the reef. So it's less mm. important in the blue water than it is on the reef. I mean, I think your shot placement has to be much better on the reef. Mm. Mm. Okay, Yeah. cool, cool. So um, what about shooting them though? Did you have the same issue that a lot of guys have like um, – you know, you're in clean water, and so you shoot and find out you're actually 10 meters away. Yes, yes. I had that, especially, you know, my, my most difficult species to hunt at the beginning when I moved to, uh, to blue water was the wahoo. Uh, I, I didn't have the right range on my gun, and my hunting technique was completely wrong. I was used to hunting on the reef. I was hunting, you know, snappers. Uh, the, the most pelagic fish I would hunt on the reef, and one of my favorites was the Spanish mackerel. But, you know, a Spanish mackerel, you can just chase. Uh, if it's not uh, swimming towards you, you can just follow it and chase it and chase it. And eventually, you can most likely get the shot in it. But try that with a wahoo, you know. Move all those techniques to the blue water and you encounter your first wahoo and you try that. And, man, you end up taking a shot and it's way too far, you know. Just like you said, I mean, the blue water has, a, has something to do with it. And then just the whole technique was completely off. What is it? Have you obviously you've taken a lot of people out to do blue water hunting? Um, is there anything that you teach them in order to help them get closer and and to to gain some perspective on exactly how close to the fish they are? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, we do. You know, the the, the first few dives, we just try to understand 
you know, how the diver is diving. I mean, just try to see the ability, uh, what kind of shots is taking, and then, you know, basically try to advise them uh, to try to hone their skills, improve their skills. And, uh, you know, especially with dog tooth, um, again, we come back to that because it is, I think it's the biggest prize in spearfishing for many reasons. Um, and, and, and it is the main target that people want to go for. So, you know, we, we try to tell them, listen, you, you've got to be able to look at that fish in the eye. You got to see the eye really well before you take that shot. Don't take any bad shots. Get in when you think you're close. Get closer, then take your shot. And um, shot placement, as you identified before, on dog tooth is a bit more important than on a yellow fin. Um, what do you advise your clients with regards to shooting them? Okay, the, the, I think the, the the main advice I give them <clears throat> is uh, try to not shoot the fish when it's broadside. I mean, let's say you level off and the fish is right in front of you. Ideally, let the fish turn slightly and start swimming away from you before you place the shot. Just to give it a bit of a diagonal uh, shot, you want the spear to go through slightly diagonally to grab more meat, uh, as much meat as possible. And uh, they, they just have a tendency of being able to tear themselves to pieces, open up holes in their bodies big enough for a slip tip to go through, or you know, if you're using a flopper for the flopper to go through. So the more diagonally the spear goes through, the more likely it is that it's gonna hold. And ideally, if you can get that spear to come out of the gill plate, then you have a very, very good holding shot. Mm. Yeah, so be patient and let the fish turn slightly. Don't shoot it right away, wait, let it slightly turn and then go for it. But that's a difficult one for the newbie to to remember when he's got that big fish in front of him. <laughs> yeah, that quartering away <laughs> shot with that sweet spot. It's difficult. Um, do, do you like the the slip tips? The you know, like the Mori and the the stainless line. Do you do, is that is that a setup you recommend? Uh, yes. Again, you know, it depends on the terrain that you're hunting on. I think. I mean, I, my preference is always for a flopper, and the biggest dog tooth we've landed. And that is, I'm saying 110 kilos, 109 kilos, and 104 kilos. Those were all landed with floppers. Uh, but, you know, Latham Island is a special situation. The fish are not hitting the bottom and entangling themselves. So I think that the flopper has more accuracy. You know, you get a longer shot. And if it's a good flopper, it'll hold. And if it's a good shot, obviously. So I prefer the flopper. Okay, cool. But uh, in, in certain terrain, definitely the slip tip is what you need if it's more rocky and, and there's more chance of the fish entangling itself. And I'm being a bit cheeky here, but what's the minimum diameter shaft that you think you can um, seriously consider taking a dog tooth with? Uh, well, I mean, I would not recommend any of my clients to have a shaft less than a seven and a half. So that means, let's say they're using a Rob Island 140. That's that's a good enough gun to shoot a very big dog tooth. So a seven and a half would be the minimum, and ideally bigger than that. Mm. Okay, cool, cool. Guys, check out KillshotSpearguns.com. They're based in the Florida Keys. Ed Martin's given listeners $30 off Killshot Spear Guns and 10% off freediving classes through to April the 1st. Check it out. Use the code NOOB to save. If you are on the phone or you head into the shop to visit Ed, just say crikey mate or something like that and uh, he'll give you some he'll give you a, a deep discount check him out killshotspearguns.com penetrator fence australian made guaranteed tough as nails with a baby's bum finish they've got a smoother flex curve than any other fin on the market this is due to a proprietary capillary closed molding manufacturing system and basically this process eliminates the need for secondary processing of materials and it produces an outstanding finish on both sides of the blade and this process also eliminates waste means less environmental impact it's just one of the benefits to using penetrator fins i had a great deal today head over to penetrator fins and if you want to buy a set pump in the code no sparrow save $25. Check them out, nosepharo.com forward slash penetrator. What about tough situations out in the ocean? You've been in the water for 40 years. Um, surely you've had some scary some scary situations out in the ocean, whether spearfishing or on the boat. Yes. Uh, well, 
yeah, I think that the scariest situation is uh, when you're on the water and, and you suddenly look up and you can't find your boat in a current. I think that, that's the scariest situation, and I've been in a couple of those. And, you know, that's, that's my biggest concerns, concern when putting clients in the water because a lot of this blue water hunting stuff is in, uh, in, in places that are way offshore with, uh, with strong currents, and you know you you need to be able to depend on someone who is on a boat uh, and watching you and making sure they're there when when you need them. I think that's the scariest situation. And I've heard many stories from many spearers where the boat just wasn't there. And uh, yeah, they've been lucky enough to to have been found at a later stage, and that includes myself. You know, I was lost at sea for a while, but fortunately, I had a bit of a plan. I had a structure I could swim to. It would have taken me some time to get there, but then I would have, and uh, and I was determined to get there. But you know, eventually, an hour later, the boat shows up. They did find me. Uh, that's that's I well, think scariest. What what happened? How, how did how did um, how did uh, you get misplaced? Because one of the scenarios I imagine is you've got two, maybe two groups of divers in the water, and one hook up, and maybe get dragged off the location, and then the other guys are in current as well. And you don't, and the boatie doesn't know which um, group of divers to hang around with. Yeah, well, that's a, that's exactly the kind of scenario that you have to watch out for. I mean, as a spearfishing charter, you know, my team on the boat knows that if anyone shoots a fish, you pick up everybody else while that guy lands the fish or, or tries fighting the fish. Uh, we, we don't want any scenarios where, you know, some clients say, no, 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 just let us drift. Come and pick us up later. And we're like, no way, man. You know, if it takes half an hour, we won't find you anymore. So it's an absolute rule on our boats, you know, to pick up everybody and then go to that guy and help him land his fish or give him the time he needs. And especially if it's a marlin or or let's say even a yellowfin tuna, something that's going to take a while to land. Um, and in my scenario, you know, I was still young. You know, I was in my early 20s. I was with a friend. I was offshore on a reef. And it wasn't my boat. It wasn't my crewman on board who was watching over me. I rented a boat from the local guys. There were two guys on board. They had no clue. I didn't explain things properly. You know, my friend and I, we got split up. They followed him. We didn't have float systems at the time. We were just hunting with reels, which makes it even more difficult to, to see someone in a slight chop. So, you know, my friend and I got separated. The boat stuck with him. And I didn't really pay notice from what I, where I was. I just kept hunting. And then eventually I realized they were miles away and they were looking for me in the wrong place. So, you know, it, it's also my responsibility that when I see myself separating, I should make an effort to, to get close to my buddy and stay close to the boat or call the boat in. And I didn't do that at that time. Do you like, um, in those situations, have you seen the, the inflatable Hiver's um, safety sausages? Um, you mean like the ones that, uh, that scuba divers use, something like that? Or? Yeah, but these ones kind of like... You can just hold them in the wind, and they um and they inflate themselves, and they're like two meters high, and they're very easy to hold in the water. You don't need a regulator to fill them or anything like that, and um, they roll up into sort of, you know, like a, you know, like a, a very like a, the, half the size of a pen, and then you can just slip it up the you know one of the sleeves of your wetsuits, and that that's that can be kind of a. You know, just a safety measure, I guess. Like a lot of guys use a bit of mirror or a whistle or something like that. But um, is that something that um, you've sort of come across? I actually have not. It sounds really interesting. I mean, I would certainly recommend that that kind of equipment. You know, I mean, we used to use in the beginning. We used to have a, a little set of pencil flares on on our float system on the last float. But you know. One, there's the problem of the expiry date that we can't get the pencil flares here. You can't fly them. So it was difficult to get, get them. And you never know. You might just shoot a fish that's going to make all your float system disappear, and then you don't have them either. <laughs> so, so it's not a solution that. I mean, uh, some people have used them, and I know kayakers use those also in South Africa. I mean, they work. But for a spear fisherman, what you just suggested sounds like a really good idea. I'll have to look into that. Absolutely. Particularly with the guys, I mean, you you guys are doing blue water stuff a, a lot of the time now, but the real gun divers seem to need something because I've had a, a couple of 
different mates get lost and separated from the boat. And when you're in current and you're out in the open ocean, it just seems like it's a recipe for disaster. Like, you know, like sometimes you get absolutely a recipe for disaster. So, I mean, that sounds like a very, very essential piece of equipment. If it's really that light, there's no reason not to have one. And it could certainly save your life. Hmm, Cool. Um, yeah, no, awesome. Yeah, that's a that's a huge tough situation. Now, a lot of people, you know, when you talk about scary stuff, they go straight to sharks or blackouts. But I think getting separated from the boat's a huge one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, sea conditions, if you have a good boat, I've been in super rough seas. I mean, you can handle that. You can handle that. You can stay calm, which you need to be even if you're in the water and lost. But, uh, yeah, I think the biggest concern is getting lost when you're on the water, lost at sea. Hmm. Cool, cool. Um, let's let's walk into Veterans Vault, which is sort of you know the area of the show where we go deep into our guest's area of expertise. Um, I've chatted up briefly with you about talking about East Africa as a dive location and sort of, I guess, all of the diveable territory and um, and the the logistics of diving a place like that might be quite tricky for the uninitiated. I'd imagine. Yes. Yes. Um... Yeah, I, I think uh, you know, I think Tanzania is a is a bit of a a confusing situation anyway because of its regulations. Uh, it, you know, obviously there, there there's one side of Tanzania. Tanzania is a is a union between two countries, and that is the Zanzibar archipelago, which was a, a country in itself, and then the mainland of Tanzania that used to be called Tan- Tanganyika. So they formed this union after independence and. But it's not, so basically it's one country now, it's Tanzania, but, but there are certain aspects that remain separate or like Zanzibar, for example, has its own fisheries laws, its own fisheries minister and uh, mainland Tanzania has the same, but yet they use the same part of the ocean. And Zanzibar allowed spear fishing, but mainland Tanzania doesn't, so... Uh, you really have to be careful where you go, whether it's legal to or not legal to. I mean, you need to be get yourself informed before you do any spearfishing in a place like this, where it's super confusing to know whether it's legal or not legal. So the Zanzibar archipelago, is it all um, boat diving? Uh, yes, it is. I mean, we have a lagoon that runs uh, around, let's say, the east coast of the island, which is pretty shallow and it's a tidal lagoon. I mean, at low water, it's, it's super shallow. So there's not much to hunt in the lagoon. And the lagoon's about, I would say, three kilometers uh, out. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not ideal for shore diving. Uh, and other than that, you know, a lot of the inner reefs are heavily fished by local fishermen, uh, artisan fishermen using nets and using hand lines and different methods of, uh, of fishing. So Ideally, for, for some nice trophy fish, uh, you need to go deeper and a little bit more offshore. So definitely, it's a boat diving destination. What about, what about first aid? Like if you get a major um, you know, arterial trauma or something out there from a serious cut or bite, um, what's, the, what's the medical evac process look like? It's, uh, it's pretty bleak, pretty bleak. Uh, I mean, yeah. Let, I, I would just say, let's hope it doesn't happen. I mean, obviously on our <laughs> boats, <laughs> on our boats, you know, we're a spearfishing charter, so we're pretty well prepared, you know, for this. We've got yep. a, a good first aid kit and we have some uh, knowledge. We've done our first aid courses. But, I mean, let's assume now mm. you've, you've rented a boat, a local guy, and he's taking you out and you have a, an accident. That's a complicated one because, you know, medical facilities in Zanzibar – few and far between just a number and quality ones i mean i could probably say there's maybe one or two on the whole island i I think that's something that all of these remote um dive locations where some of the best fish are taken all have in common it's um a lack of um you know really good medical attention that's close by so it's no it's not unique to your part of the world i think it's something that spearfishing spearfishing people have to contend with if they want to go and chase really good fish so um it's good to hear that your your operations as prepared as it can be um i pity the diy type people though you'd have to take a big first aid kit and if you went and tried it yourself yes and i'm you know i'm sure as you say people go to the pacific remote places and they're in the same situation. And if there's no spearfishing charter and you're just exploring yourself, 
I know a lot of clients come even with their own uh, first aid kits. You know, a lot of a lot of the people are pretty aware for the need to be as prepared as possible. And obviously, like you said, you take some risk when you go to some of these remote places. You know. Um, okay, what other parts of um, East Africa are worth um, having a look at if you're considering diving in that part of the world? Um, Kenya is a, is a very interesting place. It has some great fish. Unfortunately, recently they uh, they banned spearfishing. Yeah. Which is uh, why? why? What, what's going on with these governments? Why are they banning spearfishing? Man, you know it's a difficult. I asked. I was just with the one of the heads of fisheries in Kenya. Just uh, it was in January, I think. I flew there because we want to do. We want to open our spearfishing charter because there's some excellent blue water spearfishing there at certain parts, especially for billfish. And uh, and I asked him, you know, why why was it banned? And and he couldn't really answer me. He says it happened while he wasn't there yet. He doesn't really know why. I mean, they just... I think the, the, the answer I've come across here in East Africa is that you end up injuring... You possibly injure the fish and promote bacterial growth. You know, the, the fish will die somewhere else and be wasted, which is a fair point. But, you know, when you compare it to net fishing, that is perfectly illegal. Hmm, hmm. Yeah, it seems bizarre. Like, I mean, when spearfishing is practiced properly, I mean, you know yourself, like it's it's definitely the most selective form of fishing. I mean, you, you don't pull the trigger unless you want the fish that's that you've chosen. So uh, I find it quite bizarre. But it, it, it's happened in a few countries, even developed countries. Like I think Germany, it's illegal to spearfish there. So it's not it's not unique to, to that part of the world, but it's crazy. It is, yeah. No, it absolutely is. Very strange. What about further south? Have you dived Mozambique and um, just just above there, further north? Yes. Uh, look, we we you know we run a charter in the northern part of the Mozambique, which has there's another archipelago there. It's called the Quirimbas, and it's about okay. thirty islands. It's another spectacular archipelago. It's actually very very remote. Uh, and right now, as it is, you really can only dive it uh, off a yacht. Uh, which, you know, so, so it's very boat, amazing fish, amazing drop-offs, um, big fish, you know, the same species we get uh, in Zanzibar, a lot of dog tooth uh, and a lot of other nice pelagic fish. And then one of the most interesting places, just from, from a whole perspective, meaning the location, the country in itself, um, as a place to destination to visit, is Madagascar. And, you know, I, I think only a tiny bit of Madagascar is known for spearfishing, while it's, uh, it's the third largest island in the world. And it's actually everywhere you go offers some amazing spearfishing. And Chris Coates is the expert on Madagascar. So we do some charters there, but not very many. Um, but when I go there, I'm blown away just by the beauty of the island and then what it's like underwater. I mean, every day you can spearfish a different location, while here in Zanz. Zanzibar, our locations are pretty limited. You know, we have a 10, 15 spots that we dive. In Madagascar, you can discover a new spot as you go to a known spot every day. Yeah, right. right. It's very special. Awesome. Very, very special. What are, what's your, um, like on a personal level, what are the charters that, um, that you find really satisfying to run? In terms of my own charters that I, that I take out with clients? Yeah, the ones you organize. I mean, what are the ones where you know you're going to have a really good time? You know, uh, what, what trips are the ones that you really look forward to? Uh, well, I actually look forward to pretty much all of them. But <laughs> <laughs> just being out there is uh, it's just an amazing experience. But uh, no, there are certain clients that are, are, are more fun to be with. Uh, you know, there, there is that client who's super, super focused, wants to land that fish and can somewhat be a little bit grumpy because they're not landing it. You know, that, that makes it a bit of a, a more tense situation. And, and, and despite trying to, to talk it through and, and make it a little bit more humorous, sometimes that can be pretty difficult. So the guys who come with no expectations and just want to have a good time, those are the trips that I really enjoy going with, the people who appreciate just being there. Even landing a green jobfish for the first time doesn't have to be a dog tooth, you know, just some some new species, uh, a nice hunt, and and then having that on your plate on the yacht uh, at the end of the day, 
th those are the yeah my favorite trips where people don't have too many expectations. They just want to have some fun. I saw the your best um, job fish was pretty tiny. Uh, I think I said thirteen kilos or something like um, <laughs> cheap as you. You uh, you wouldn't. Yeah, it's a baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel guilty when you when you put it out of its misery for being such a runt? <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, it's 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 almost it's almost as satisfying to shoot such a baby jobfish as it is to shoot a big dog tooth. I mean you know, you know, once you've shot all these fish, I mean in my lifetime I've shot a lot of fish. You know, some people ask me, well, you know, what are you really looking forward to shooting? And, and there's just so much fun and, and satisfaction to be had in shooting a jobfish of that size. I mean, that, that's, that's a personal best. It's a record. It's, the hunt is, is an amazing thing. And, and then, you know, yeah, it's super satisfying. <laughs> I, I haven't even shot one over four kilo, so I'm uh, being really <laughs> cheeky here. But uh, I I love I love being on the bottom, and um, they come in at you, and then they just turn, and they, those that uh, pectoral fin gets vertical, and they just turn on a dial right in front of you. They just their profile in the water is just something else. Yeah, and it's such a fun fish to hunt. You know, that's uh, you know you, you obviously know the trick to hunting the the job fish. I think a lot of people use it. So no, 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 no. I I, I want your trick to hunting job fish. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. I mean, I, I think uh, I, I think it's not uh, an unknown method, but uh, it works, especially with the job fish. I mean, my two favorite fish to hunt on the bottom are the job fish and uh, and the emperor. So we get these long nose emperors, we get the spangled emperor, uh, and I think the latter two are more difficult to hunt than job fish. Job fish tend to be. Uh, more a bolder you know they, they come in closer but basically i think that the, the the best way to hunt all of those species is to use your free hand and dig it into the sand and just shake your hand and let that sand sort of shake and come up into the water column create a bit of a sand cloud basically simulating some sort of a feeding behavior and they cannot resist to come in and have a look mm -hmm. you know they, they just have to come and see what are you feeding on I want some of that. And, uh, and you just see them swim off first, then you start that practice, and then suddenly they just turn around and swim right in at you. Um, so I would say, you know, the majority of the times you'll get a shot off at a, at a job fish that doesn't want to come in. Uh, using that method, it's very likely you'll get a good shot. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and I've, I've, I've seen a couple of big ones shot. I've never taken a big one myself. It's something I'm really looking forward to doing. They're, they're an awesome fish. They've got a lot of character. I, I just find their whole um, their face and the way they look at you, they're just a really neat fish. So um, I can see why you like them as well. That's, uh, they're definitely a people. How do you classify them? They're not really like a, a resident reef fish, are they? No, no, exactly, exactly. I mean, I, I don't consider them to be a resident reef fish. They are a demersal species, meaning they do feed off the bottom, but they tend to be, uh, they do tend to migrate. Uh, obviously, we, you know, we don't know, it's like dog tooth, we don't really know where they go at certain times of the year. Our dog tooth are not there. They, they, they go into deeper water, they go somewhere else, we just don't know. Um, but yeah, the jobfish I would say is 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 a reef species, but not resident. And do you do you burley for them as well, or do you prefer to hunt them from the bottom? Look, if it's myself, I will never burley for them. I'll just hunt them. Uh, I much prefer that hunt. They become stupid when you burley for them. And yeah, I, I do do that for some clients uh, who have particular difficult time, maybe you know lying on the bottom. You need to have a bit of a breath hold to hunt a jobfish. You need to be able to get the bottom, let that fish get away from you, come back in, go away again. You know, you need to have a good breath hold uh, to hunt a jobfish. So burley is good for some clients. So guys coming to Africa, I mean, um, it sounds like it's, it's more or less one of those places where you, it's very tough to do it by yourself unless you know people. Yes, yes. Uh, definitely in East Africa, that is the case. I mean, there are no other spearfishing charters around here. There, there is no spearfishing community the way that we spearfish. You know, you have local 
uh, East African native spear fishermen with homemade guns mainly and very basic gear, and they hunt the shallows for anything, anything that they can put on their plate uh, at home at the end of the day. Uh, you know, they'll hunt octopus, they'll try and get lobster, they'll get surgeon fish, whatever they can hunt. So there's no spear fishing community here that you can learn from. Um, so it's very difficult to come here on your own and find someone who's going to take you to the spots and, uh, and, and, you know, basically keep a good eye on you when you're in the water. Uh, so you might have that scenario where the guys are in a precarious situation. So, yeah, I mean, definitely here I, I do recommend using a charter. I mean, obviously we're the only one at the moment, so I'm recommending use us, <laughs> which is not really what I want to say, but, but it's, there's, no, there's no shore diving, you know? It's not like you can just no, run no. out and dive off. So it's a difficult, yes, it's a difficult place to, to come and dive. Um, <laughs> how, can people, how can people find you and, uh, and, and maybe look at some of the options they have for booking trips there? Uh, yeah, I mean, mainly our website, uh, that's the best way to find us. And we're pretty responsive on email when we get an inquiry. That's so your, the best your way website, e extremebluewaterspearfishing.com? Correct. Yes. Yes. Cool. And, um, and, and, uh, you, are you, you guiding yourself at the moment? I do guide. I do guide a lot of, especially the trips to Latham Island. I'll guide myself, um, we, at the moment, we, you know, we get quite a turnaround of guides. I mean, David Dupav stayed with us for three years in Zanzibar. So we did get to a state where he would go on his own and do some of the charters. Um, now we have a new guide. His name is Luke Mollison. He's a fantastic guide. He's actually a really good friend of, of David's. Okay. And, uh, and, and he's also at a stage now where he can actually take groups out without me. I don't know. Somehow, you know, that's that's my that's my spot. So I try to go out as much as possible to Latham Island uh, with any charter that goes that way. But around Zanzibar, for example, I don't always guide myself. My uh, my guide Luke will take them out, and you know, he's he's actually a much better spear fisherman than I am. He's twenty years younger. Yeah, cool. But you're you're a you're you're a decent diver in your own right, uh, Eric, and it's 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 awesome to get your story on. Um, have has have your diving abilities declined as you've got older? I'm not being cheeky. I'm asking seriously. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question. Have they declined? I would say no. I mean, I'm still reaching the depths, you know. And I I, I think uh, you know spearfishing is a great sport because you don't necessarily get old uh, until. I think, you know, I've probably got another good 10 years before I would get old in this sport. Uh, you know, I'm 53 now and I'm still diving. If I want to, I'll still dive to 40 meters. Yeah, jeez. Um, but, you know, I just won't do it as often as some of the young guys. I mean, I'll only go to 40 meters when I'm hunting dog tooth. I'm not going to go to 40 meters to hunt a job fit. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. My, my physical ability is not what it used to be, but in terms of depths and, and, and bottom times, I mean, they're good. I just don't do it as often. Yeah. I, um, I went diving with a mate of mine in New Zealand um, three years ago, and he's um, mid to late 50s, and, you know, he, he outworked me all day long. So um, it wasn't a facetious comment, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's good to hear because I want to I want to dive well into my <laughs> 60s as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great sport because you can dive well into your 50s. This episode of the Noob Sparrow podcast is brought to you by the world's greatest spearfishing magazine, Spearing Magazine. There are news and reviews for the latest spearfishing equipment and gadgets inside. There's practical how-to and DIY type articles. There's spearing adventures from crazy noobers like you from all over the world. And uh, it's, it's a magazine that you can pick up or you can look at. And if you've got the digital subscription, you can flick through and let it inspire your next spearfishing adventure, even if you're having a dry run. Keep the stoke alive. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. If you're away from the good old USA, though, check out the international subscription. That's at spearingmagazine.com. 
Hey guys, today's podcast is brought to you by freedivingsafety.com. It's powered by Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. He won an award and he decided to create something that could help the whole world, every single person wanting to get into freedive spearfishing. There's a whole bunch of foundational principles and knowledge that you can learn at freedivingsafety.com. It'll help you to catch more fish and have more fun, believe it or not. It's not just a safety course. This is practical information in there for helping you to not only manage the risk, but to have more fun and look after your mates and yourself. Check it out, freedivingsafety.com. What about your personal dive bag? Um, give me your. Can you give me a run through of your equipment? My dive bag, you know, I've, I've got pretty much everything I need for blue water. So I've got my, my uh, long fins, uh, carbons. Uh, I've got uh, a nice diving mask, obviously snorkel. Uh, for the water temperatures that we have here, we won't go more than a three mil. So I usually use about a 2.5. <clears throat> okay. Um, Cambo suit. Uh, Any brand preference? Um, look, on my fins at the moment, and I've been using for many years, are the Majestic Carbons. These are built, okay. uh, custom built by a guy in Greece. Uh, excellent, excellent fins. And, you know, he's... he's uh, He's quite uh, finicky on detail and they're excellent fins. There are many out there. and This is a, a very good uh, quality fin. Uh, for a mask, I'm using uh, a Technisub, a uh, low-volume Technisub mask. And then I think it's a, just a crazy it's – a, it's a mix of brands, really. Mm, mm. Uh, for a wetsuit, at the moment, I'm using Polosub, which I find are really, really good. You know, we use them a lot. Uh, in our charters so you know we're often in them and uh, we like to have a suit that's well built that will last a long time and at the moment the polo, polo soup is an excellent wetsuit fantastic uh, it's a 2.5 with a with a blue camo yeah nice and then i'll have uh, you know i think my most important piece of equipment is my flasher i mean that's essential for blue water spearfishing and without that you know you're pretty much lost in the blue no fish. So, what is your, what is your flasher design? Um, so, I have a, a very simple design, which I think was invented, or that I hear, uh, uh, that I hear was came from Madagascar. There's a, a guy by the name of Craig Scott. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, um, but he started a spearfishing charter in Madagascar well before Chris Coates went, and well before I did. And uh, and it's basically just a little squid with a nice uh, shiny tail uh, on, a, on, a, on a piece of line. Uh, and before that, you know, I had a lot of hangy, hangy flashy stuff on my flasher. But uh, since I learned about this flasher, it's basically just a single squid in a horizontal position with, with a nice shiny tail. And, you know, as you, as you pull it up and down, it, does, it has this very nice up and down motion as if it's swimming up and down. And I find that it's irresistible with dog tooth, wahoo, uh, billfish, and really it's unnecessary to have all the other flashy stuff that go above uh, above it. So it's a very simple flash, and it worked really well. Okay, yeah. So in terms of guns, okay, yeah, I have. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly fond of roller guns uh, since I discovered them in 2011. Okay, I had a I had a group of Italian Spiros who came to visit, and they had these little short roller guns, and they were shooting wahoo, but we had to shoot with a 140. So wow, that sparked my interest, and and uh, these guns were made by whom you probably know now, Itio Alemanni. Yeah, and uh, and so I contacted him, and at the time when I contacted him, his longest gun was a 105 centimeter gun basically for shooting uh, fish in the med some of the bigger fish that they get mm. so i asked him to make a 130 for me to hunt doggies and uh, so he they, he made the first 130 alemanni and uh, i gave him the name i said look why don't you call it a blue water express and so he stuck uh, he went with that name and until today it's called the blue water express yeah, and uh, we still have i still have in my in my arsenal here i still have the very first one that he made and it was an exceptional gun at the time and uh, yeah so i generally hunt with the roller guns wooden roller guns teak made by itio alemanni which i find are fantastic guns for hunting big dog tooth 
especially the Vela model, which has a 10 mil sphere. <laughs> 10 mil, that would put a bit of, that would hurt a fish. Well, that's what you want to do with a dog tooth. I mean, you need everything you've got. You need it. You need the weight of the spear, you need the impact, and then you need everything else to work because otherwise you're losing that fish. Um, so, so people can come and find you at uh, extremebluewaterspearfishing.com. Um, I wanted to um, – are you on social media at all? Yes, yes. We do have an Instagram page and we have a Facebook page under the same name. Okay. Extremebluewaterspearfishing.com. Uh, well, extremebluewaterspearfishing. Well, I'll link um, everything up today that we've talked about and maybe a couple of videos from your part of the world. They'll be at noobspiro.com forward slash Eric. And, uh, and and people can get hold of you through there. But that, that, that was fantastic um, chatting with you today. Unfortunately, the internet's not perfect, but um, still, still good to chat with you regardless. I appreciate that, Isaac. And it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Huge episode there. What an absolute champion. Eric Allard. Uh, Lift your hands, jeepers! What a what an awesome character. Him and Nigel sound like a, a pair of dudes. Uh, I'd love to get out there and go spearing with them at some stage. That might happen one day in the future. Who knows? Um, right, next week we're off to chat with G R Tar, the Red Tide Savage. He's the man behind uh, Red Tide Spearfishing over in the states, and a real character of a man. Really. Uh, like well, he's a legend in the sport but he's also like a really creative guy a deep thinker about um parts of spearfishing we get we get into some cool stuff in this episode so i'm looking forward to rejoining you again probably in a week let's hook back in and uh if hey if you love the show get on to patreon.com forward slash noob spirit and become a patron listener every single dollar earned goes towards funding trips where i get to come out and go diving with listeners um, do live interviews and just hang out in your part of the world uh, i'm hoping to do a u.s trip next year but who knows with all the uh covid stuff still hanging around and uh all the rest of it but anyway Thanks for listening. I'm out. Jeepers, spearfishing has to be the most addictive thing. It takes over. If you're not actually out there spearfishing, you're talking about spearfishing. You're listening to spearfishing. And you're always shopping for spearfishing gear. Today's sponsor comes in super handy for that. Spearfishing.com.au. You can check out a whole bunch of great brands. They've got brands on there like Rob Allen, Rife, Picasso, Salvamas, Borisar, Boshat. Shark Shield, the list just keeps going. Now, I love the, the shopping experience at spearfishing.com.au. They've been sponsoring this show since episode 18. I would encourage you to head over there, check out equipment, whole range, huge range of equipment. Check out the reviews. If you do decide to purchase something, use the code NoobSpero on any purchase over 200 and save yourself $20. Spearfishing.com.au. Support the Noob Spiro podcast. Can't go wrong. <laughs>